Good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to class this morning, Faith and Function. And um, we're joined together in spirit and um, in hope and in each other's living rooms. So, or in my case, in a, uh, kind of a little library here. And it is good to be with you all. Um, as Daniel said, when you enter the call, you're automatically muted. There may be um, a Q&A session at the end um, where you can unmute. And uh, if that happens, um, one of us will let you know how to do that. And there is also the option to chat. Um, if you wave your mouse over the bottom bar, there's kind of a little menu bar down at the bottom. And um, you could type in a question and one of us can read it. But we'll get to that at the end. Um, right here at the beginning, just a couple of announcements. Um, Dr. Morris, uh, who I'll give a, um, a bigger introduction to in just a moment, he's going to be joining us for three non-consecutive um, classes. So today and then May 3rd and May 10th. And he's going to be talking to us about resurrection and community, sort of uniquely qualified to talk about those things, I think. Um, next week, though, we're going to have somebody um, from CAFE come talk about resilience. And that's also a really timely topic right now. So I hope you'll join us. So Dr. Morris, welcome. And thank you for coming. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Morris is a well-known leader in our community and in some sense really needs no introduction. Of course, most of us will know that he is both uh, a physician and an ordained minister. Um, and uh, he is also the founder and CEO of um, Church Health here in Memphis. And his organization has been taking a leading role in um, kind of being on the front lines of this pandemic and doing um, one of the main testing sites for COVID-19. So we are grateful for your service in our community. Um, but he's not here to talk to us today about COVID-19. Uh, he is here to talk to us about resurrection and community. So we welcome you to our class and I am just gonna open us uh, in prayer here. Um, I'm going to do what I normally do, which is to just um, have a few breaths of silence. If you don't hear me for a couple of, uh, for 20 seconds, 15 seconds, there's nothing wrong. I'm just getting us all here and getting myself here before I open us in prayer. And then I'll hand it over to Dr. Morris. So let's, um, let's enter ourselves and go to God in prayer. God of this uh, rainy spring day, um, of birds singing and plants sprouting and flowers budding um, and joy and new life all around us. But on the edges of our world and for some it's close, a creeping darkness of fear and anxiety and isolation. But God, you are Lord of that too. Help us to trust that. Teach us something about community this morning in these strange times where we cannot commune physically. Teach us how to be the church to each other and to the world. And teach us, we ask something about the hope of resurrection. And we need that hope and that message now more than ever. We ask that you open our eyes to new insights, new hope, and new joy so that we can be the people that you created us to be even in these bizarre times. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
So at this point, I am going to mute and turn the show over to Dr. Morris, who on my screen is just to my uh, right. I'm not sure about yours, but um, anyway, Dr. Morris. Great, Julie. Uh, you and Daniel have done great setting this up. And y'all, I don't know about you, but I am really excited to, uh, and been looking forward to uh, spending this time with you talking about something other than COVID-19. Now, with that said, um, at the end, uh, during the conversation and chat, I'll leave enough room that if, if there are questions about the role Church Health has played, um, particularly our role in testing for the city, uh, which, which we are in charge of that for better or worse, um, I'd, I'd be more than happy to a answer questions uh, at the end. Um, but right now we are going to talk about resurrection. So I, I was charged to... Um, to spend some time for really three sessions to talk about the post-resurrection appearances that are in the Gospels. Um, and my session today is really, I just want us to get the story out there. Um, it, you know, it's hard to fathom sometimes um, how this works in the Gospel, but the reality is there are four Gospels, and they each tell the story of the resurrection and what happened afterwards in really, really different ways. Um, <clears throat> and then there's a fifth um, uh, discussion about it, which we're going to begin with. But um, look, here's what we are certain of, is that Jesus dies in 30 AD. Um, he's crucified by Rome. Um, he's placed in a tomb, and then something happened. You know, the, the, the biggest skeptic out there can't, can't deny the fact that something happened. You know, that there were plenty of other prophets out there um, that had a following. I mean, just look at John the Baptist. You know, it, it would appear that John the Baptist had a much bigger following than Jesus ever did. And yet after his death, nothing happens. Um, he doesn't develop an ongoing uh, following that creates a community um, after his death. Uh, so the, the biggest skeptic out there cannot deny the fact that something happened. Now, the question becomes, so what? You know, if Jesus is raised from the dead, what difference does that have to do with me? Good, good for Jesus. You know, get, glad he got to keep living. But, but what does that have to do with me? So that's really what I, I want us to try to think long and hard about over these three sessions, particularly around the issue of how each gospel writer is trying to address that question for, for the community that, that he's writing to. So. Um, Here's what's clear. It was not perspicuous, clear, obvious to the early church what the resurrection meant. You know, you, you may be struggling yourself in your own life here the week after Easter to go, okay, we didn't have the Easter bunny. Um, we didn't get to sing Christ the Lord has risen today, but it's a week later and things are in some ways, you know, back to what, whatever normal is. Um, but it wasn't clear to the early church either. You know, that don't feel like you're alone here 2,000 years later struggling to understand what it meant. It wasn't clear to the early church either. So um, today I want to get the plot down, and I want to outline the five ways the New Testament tries to tell the story. So Jesus dies in 30 A.D., the resurrection occurs, whatever that means. But then the first gospel, Mark, is not written until 70 AD. That is 40 years later. You know, a lot hap can happen in 40 years, right? Um, what happens here in the biggest issue is that we read in the gospels about uh, Jesus's encounter with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and then the Zealots. 
So the zealots are people who want to rise up and as Jews rebel against Rome. Um, Jesus clearly rejects that point of view, but during that 40 year time frame, the zealots win the day within the Jewish mindset to the point where a war breaks out in 66 AD, you could say a foolhardy war, where the Jews rise up and try to throw off the burden of Rome. Now that war lasts four years. It's incredibly brutal. It ultimately ends in 70 AD with the total destruction of Jerusalem and probably most important with the complete destruction of the temple. So, so what does it mean that the temple is destroyed in 70 AD? It means that all of the way that Jews come to feel that they worship God is turned completely upside down. The whole process of sacrificing to God at the temple can't do it anymore. There, there is no temple. So if that's the case, then it also changes the structure of Jewish society. There are no longer need for priests. The, the Sadducees, who are the temple leaders, that entire uh, realm of Judaism, number one, they've lost their meaning, but plus most of them were killed during uh, the war. And then the zealots, you can guarantee that they were all killed. Um, and then a fourth element, which we don't really read about in the New Testament, but we know a lot about now, which are called the Essenes. This is a group that has completely rejected Jewish society, believes that the end of the world is near. They have left Jerusalem and gone out into the desert and set up their own community. Now we know about them because they are the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, they also no longer exist in 70 AD, which leads from a Jewish perspective only what in the New Testament are referred to as the Pharisees. The Pharisees who are teachers, um, the keepers of the law, they remain the only Jewish group that is viable. Now, after 70 AD, they also have withdrawn from Jerusalem. Um, we can talk more about how that happens at, a, at another session, but all of a sudden, the only two entities out there trying to make sense of how God relates to us as Jews are what's left of the Pharisees and what are now referred to as Christians. You know, we can never forget the fact that Jesus was a Jew. Jesus uh, fully engaged in what it meant to be a Jew. But so Jew, Jesus went to the temple himself but what's clear is even after Jesus' death and resurrection, the early Christians kept going to the temple. I mean, we have lots of stories in the Acts of the Apostles of the uh, disciples going to the temple. But after 70 AD, all of that has gone away. And it is imperative for the church to now say, so what? Now, the other critical thing that we have to answer related to who Jesus is, and especially the issue of crucifixion and resurrection, is what we know from Josephus, a Roman writer who's Jewish himself, who writes about the war between Rome and uh, the Jews, is that during the siege of Jerusalem, which took almost a year, at one Point, there were 10,000 crosses that surrounded Jerusalem. 10,000 at one time. I can't take a long people. You know, think about our own feeling about the number of people who are dying from COVID 19. You know, if there were 10,000 in Memphis, everybody here on this call already knows one or two people who either have died or been severely affected by the virus. 
But what if there were 10,000 people in Memphis who had died from the virus? The question then becomes, well, why is Jesus more important than everybody else? He's just one more guy, right? Just one more guy who dies. Um, it is imperative for Mark to try to answer that question. And it also becomes imperative for the other gospel writers. So 10 years later, uh, 10 to 15 years later, Matthew and Mark are trying to address these same issues. Now, it's not so fresh in everybody's mind that the Rome has destroyed everybody and people that we loved have been killed in Jerusalem. Um, so it's a little bit like now trying to think back on 9-11, you know, maybe about the same time frame, but you have a whole generation that might not have even been born uh, when the war happened and Jews were uh, destroyed. So you have a new way. I think somebody needs to mute. Hundred A.D. That that is now twenty to thirty years after um, the 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 Rome has been destroyed. Now we're talking now sixty to seventy years after Jesus has died and been raised from the dead. I mean that's a little bit like us trying to take your teenagers and get them to understand World War II. Um, you know, that is not so easy. You know, everybody on this call, we all have parents or grandparents who served in World War II, and so we sort of get it. Um, but what we get is the Vietnam War. But it is as hard for your teenagers to understand Vietnam as it is for that, them to understand World War II. So, so John is writing at that same very distant time frame. And yet the answers, the questions remain the same. Okay, so that is second frame. So what, what I just said hopefully is clear to you is that none of the gospel writers are trying to write a history of what happened to Jesus. You know, they're not trying to say this happened, this happened, this happened. See, isn't it clear? That, that it can't possibly be the point of any of them. And it's for that reason, all four of them write very different stories because they're trying to answer this question is, so what? What difference does it make that Jesus was raised from the dead? All right, now, the four gospels though are not the first account we have of the resurrection. Now, those of you who had me teach your class before knows that at this point, I would be asking everybody to raise their hand. So what was the first account? Okay, you don't unmute. I'm going to tell you. I will reveal this to you right now. <laughs> that first account comes from Paul. Now, I am sure nobody out there came to this class without bringing your Bible. So everyone of you, pick up your Bible. Okay, if you didn't bring it, I'm going to read it for you. And we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 15. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians 15. So Paul um, writes the first, well, first letter to the Corinthians, we think, between 56 and 57 AD. So again, let's put that in time frame. Jesus dies in 30. Uh, Jerusalem's destroyed in 70. Paul is now writing at, between 50 and 57. So that is still 20 years after the fact, right? Now, what we know about Paul is that he is a contemporary at some level, at least with the disciples. So Paul knows Peter. Paul knows James, the brother of Jesus. Um, he has a lot of conflict with them. We get especially from the letter to Galatians. Um, but Paul is out there trying to uh, talk particularly Gentile communities into following Jesus. 
he makes this argument in his letters. He is personally out there doing this in the probably uh, late 30s, 40s, into the 50s. That's when Paul's out there doing this. So writing in 56, 57 AD, Paul's been doing this for a long time. Now, what this letter is all about is, believe it or not, people in the church are not getting along. Can you imagine that? That churches arguing among themselves among about relatively petty things. So flip back to uh, uh, First Corinthians in the first uh, chapter. And in the 10th verse, I'll just read to you Paul's introduction. I appeal to you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there, it, there be no dissension among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Okay, can you, is there any church out there that that wasn't written for? Um, now, over the course of Corinthians, Paul goes through what now to us are like, are you kidding me? They're arguing about that stuff. Um, and then ultimately, when we get to the 13th chapter, which most of you could say by heart, um, the love chapter, you know, he's outlining all these different ways they're fighting among themselves. And then Paul says, but I will show you a better way, which is the love chapter, which most of us probably had read at our weddings. When he finishes that, he then goes into, in chapter 14, the big problem that he's addressing, which we're going to go, really, that's it, which is the issue of people talking in tongues in the congregation. You know, glossolalia, speak, you know, what Pentecostalists do. Um, I'm, I've never known a uh, Presbyterian to do it, but, but maybe some of y'all speak in tongues and I didn't know it. But um, anyway, he is addressing that and the problem with that, how it works, how they should be on the same page about that. And then in order to get everybody to follow his opinion is where he then talks about his own experience of the resurrected Christ. So, so we are now in chapter 15 um, and beginning in the third verse, I'll read this to you. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. All right, so what is wrong with that outline of who Jesus appeared to? There's a number of things wrong in our minds. Now, but first off, I want to make it clear. That is the first written account we have of Jesus' resurrection and what happens after the resurrection. That is the first account. So when I say there's nothing, there's there are a number of things wrong, we're gonna start with where are the women? Where are the women? There are no women in Paul's account. No Mary, no Salome, no Mary, the mother of James. Not there. Number two, there's actually no empty tomb. There's not an account. He doesn't mention the empty tomb. Now, maybe you can imply that 
but there's not a story that he is referring to about how anybody goes to the tomb and it's empty. Number three, there is no mention of where any of this occurred. Now, now I'm gonna talk about this in a few minutes about the gospels. Um, they each disagree about where the resurrection appearances occur, but it doesn't tell us if it's in Galilee or in Jerusalem. It's just not there. Now, what he does do is affirm that Peter is first. When he says here, he first appeared to Peter, which at least half the Gospels agree with that. Um, but he does say that. He, he then says, uh, so he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. What's wrong about appearing to the Twelve? If you're talking about the 12, that would include Judas, right? So is Paul not aware of the stories of Judas and his betrayal of Jesus? Now, to say that he appears to the 12, is he just, did he just lose count? He doesn't seem to actually be all that aware of Judas's role, and particularly the stories that we have in the Gospels of Judas hanging himself or spilling his guts or whatever. That's just not there. He then says he appeared to um, the 500. Where did they come from? He appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. So if we look at Acts uh, chapter 1 and 15, just soon after the resurrection, if you count up the numbers that Acts refers to, you get that the original community is about 120 people, 120. But, but Paul is now claiming that he appears to 500, most of whom are still alive in 57 AD most of whom are still alive, but we have no other reference to 500 anywhere. He then also talks about how he appears to James. Now, who is James? You know, most people will argue, most scholars will argue that he is referring to James, the brother of Jesus the brother of Jesus. Um, we know that James is an incredibly important figure in the early church, especially around the community that is formed in Jerusalem after the resurrection. But Paul is the only one who points out that Jesus appears to James. And then lastly, he appears to Paul. Really. He doesn't say hardly anything about it. He makes another reference about in Galatians, how Jesus appeared to him. You know, we know the story in Acts of the Damascus Road. Now, in, on the Damascus Road story, uh, Paul actually only hears Jesus. He doesn't actually see Jesus that Paul sees Jesus, and the same thing's true when he refers to it in, uh, in Galatians. Uh, he doesn't say, was it on the Damascus Road? He just says he appeared to him. Hopefully you can see right there, just in that outline of the first account that we have of the post-resurrection uh, stories, uh, we weren't reading that last Sunday. I don't, did y'all read that last Sunday? I'm guessing you didn't read that last Sunday. You, you probably read something directly from the Gospels. Um, okay. I want to turn now to the Gospels. So if I, I were in your Sunday night board and I would four columns. So it gets ridiculously confusing. 
Um, all right. So again, we are trying to figure out what is the relevance that Jesus's resurrection has to the congregation that the four gospel writers are addressing. All right. We're going to start, we're going to go in order of how, when we think they were written. So Mark, we believe Mark was written soon destruction of the temple uh, in 70 AD in, uh, of Jerusalem. Now, in Mark's gospel, we actually have Jesus predicting his own death three different times. So I'm just going to, the first one occurs in Mark 8. If you're following along here. So um, Mark 8, um, 31. And I'm reading, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. Okay. There are going to be three times that Jesus says that to the disciples but they don't seem to get it. it 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 doesn't sink in that they try to convince him that he doesn't know what he's talking about and it, and it clearly just doesn't sink in all right jesus is crucified paul has a lot to say about jesus's crucifixion but we're not going to cover that today but he is crucified and he is put into a tomb and then chapter 16 who actually goes to the tomb? Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. So if you're writing this down, keep track to just see how this is going to change in all four Gospels. But in Mark, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Mary the mother of James. Would that mean Jesus's mother? If James is the brother of Jesus, or is this another James? We don't know. And then lastly, Salome, who, who I have no idea who she is. Um, all right, now, the three of them get there, um, and then in verse two, and very early on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb when the sun had risen. Um, and they get there, who's gonna roll away the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone was rolled back. It's just rolled back. Nobody does it. It's just rolled back. It was very large. And entering a tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side. So the women go, the tomb is open. They walk in and there's a young man, not an angel, a young man who is sitting there. Um, and he said to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. All right, the women are there. The tomb is empty. A young man tells the women Go tell Peter and the disciples, again, Peter's priority, um, to then go to Galilee. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. There is a few more verses in our gospels that are written but we now believe those next verses could have been written up to a hundred years later the original gospel ends right there so what does that mean where was jesus the, the first gospel we have there's no appearance of jesus 
Jesus ain't there. The disciples are told to go to Galilee and Jesus will meet them. But we don't know if he showed up. We don't know that they went. But what we know is that they were afraid. Now, when we meet together again, I'm going to start with asking the question of what does this mean in Mark? What, what is he trying to tell his community? Remember, Mark is the one writing in 70 AD after the destruction and everybody's fear. That's a recurring theme here, right? Everybody's fear is overwhelming. You know, in some ways, what I think, you know, the gospel speaks to us in our time and our situation, no matter what. And so within our own fear today, here's an example of where the gospel might be speaking to us if we can just spend the time to understand what is Mark trying to say, not only to his own community, but what does it say to us in the light of our fear? All right, again, I wanna get all this laid out today so that then we can uh, come back in the next two sessions to unpack you know, what any of it might mean. So let's move to Matthew. Um, so Matthew, probably written 10, 15 years after that, um, written primarily to a, a Jewish community, although in some ways everybody's writing to a Jewish community. Um, we get to Matthew 28. Uh, now, who goes to the tomb? Here we have Mary Magdalene, so that's consistent with Mark, and the other Mary. Well, which, which other Mary are we talking about? It, it doesn't say. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. That's who goes, only two. Again, two women. When they get there, there is an earthquake. And then an angel rolls back the stone for them. And that angel speaks to the women. Not a young man, an angel after an earthquake, the guards fall down, you know, it's a different scenario than Mark. Um, the women then look into the tomb, see that it's empty, and then they uh, are told to go to the disciples, not just Peter first, but go to the disciples, and then also they are to give the message to go to Galilee. And that's the same mass message we have in Mark, to go to Galilee. Um, after they hear that message, um, they go to uh, Galilee, and then Jesus meets them. Here we actually have an experience of the risen Christ where Jesus meets them, and then in the Galilee. Now, what is, how far is the Galilee? For those of you who've been to um, Israel before, uh, it's a pretty long hike from Jerusalem to the Galilee. I mean, it's at least an hour, hour and a half ride in a, in a bus, and then to walk. I mean, it's several days walk to get to the Galilee. So it's not like they're, they went there this afternoon. Um, but they go to the Galilee, and then it is there that Jesus gives the Great Commission. So in Matthew, there is only one post-resurrection appearance. And that is in the Galilee, where Jesus gives the Great Commission. All right, Luke, we got two more to go. Um, Luke, and remember that Luke writes two books, Luke and Acts. Um, we get to the end of Luke, which is Luke chapter 24. Um, here, we have Mary Magdalene. She ranks at every turn, right? You know, what we're going to see, there's only one person who is in all four Gospels who goes to the empty tomb. That is Mary Magdalene. Here we have Joanna. Then again, Mary, the mother of James. And then here, and the other women. And the other women. So this is a large group, right? Mary, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women. That is who goes to the tomb. 
there is no angel. They don't see an angel here. The, the tomb is open. They look in and there are two men in shining ro robes remind them that what Jesus has said. They don't see Jesus. Okay, the women don't see Jesus at the tomb. But in the meanwhile, that Peter, in a story we're not told, has an encounter with Jesus. We then read the story of two other disciples of some sort, probably not of the 12. They meet Jesus on the Emmaus Road. We all know that story. Um, then those two who meet Jesus on the, uh, on the Emmaus Road return to Jerusalem to tell the 11, not the 12, the 11 at which point Jesus appears to them. In that appearance, Jesus makes it extremely clear that he is not a ghost. You know, see my hands, see my feet. You know, it is, I am flesh and blood. It is very important that the physicality of this is up there. Um, and then we get to Acts, which, it opens with Jesus having done many proofs and that they are then to continue and they continue to see Jesus for a while in Jerusalem. No, no going to Galilee. All of this happens in Jerusalem. And then it ends on the Mount of Olives where Jesus is ascended. Okay, lastly, with John. Um, in John, there's only Mary Magdalene. Only Mary Magdalene. Um, she, she gets there. She finds the tomb open. It's empty. She then runs back to tell Peter and the beloved disciple that the body's been moved. Then Peter, the beloved disciple, and the other disciples, whoever that is, run back. and then after seeing the empty tomb they return to their own homes again in jerusalem mary is left at the tomb crying where there she encounters two angels two this time and jesus now mary is clearly pretty important here right so she's the only person present in all four um in, uh, gospels um, how important she is to Jesus, we don't know, but what we do know is Jesus is standing right there and she doesn't recognize him. She thinks he's the gardener. Something's different here, right? Something's clearly different. Now, eight days later, Jesus appears um, uh, with the disciples. Uh, Thomas touches him, um, and then there are more appearances with smaller groups of disciples in Galilee. So in John, we have both Jerusalem and Galilee. Um, we are told that Jesus did many more things, too many to recount, and then he's gone. We're not, we're, there's no ascension. It just ends. All right, I'm almost done. So how long does all this happen? You know, Jesus is raised on the third day. Great. Well, he, we, we don't see him around today. Maybe some of y'all have seen him. I haven't seen him lately. Um, but at what point do the resurrection uh, stories end? So in John, it seems to be almost indefinite. You know, there's no time frame given in John. He just says, after this, Jesus did this. And he does many things. And it seems to go on. In Luke and Acts, it's clear, 40 days. Jesus is around for 40 days, from Passover to Pentecost. 40 days is when whatever he's going to do after the resurrection has taken place. Um, and then... Uh, 
we do hear him in Luke Acts speak to Paul on the Damascus Road. So after the ascension, does Jesus keep coming back down to talk to other people, or is it just to, uh, uh, just to Paul? Um, you know, Paul then says he did, uh, did it to him, uh, mentioned to him, and then obviously with Mark, we got no post-resurrection appearances, and Matthew, we only have the one. There we go, y'all. I'm sure you wrote all that down and it's clear as mud to you, but um, well, what do we make of all this? I mean, what, what does any of this mean that we don't just have one story? Okay, because we clearly don't, that there is not one story of the resurrection. Um, each author, including Paul, is trying to help his community understand what the resurrected Christ means for their lives and probably most importantly for their community. So look, I'll, let me just stop right there. It's 1030. We got just a few more minutes. Um, and just are there questions out there that on this I can uh, address? And then again, I, I'm going to in our next two sessions, not just run our way through it. I, I, if you took notes, I hope, hope you will. I'm not going to go through all that again. But um, in the next two sessions, I'm going to try to break it down uh, gospel by gospel, what, what I think um, they're trying to say to us by telling the post-resurrection story. All right. Daniel, can you, uh, or Julie, are there any questions I need to answer? So we, we, we have a question about coronavirus testing that we'll get to in a minute. Okay. Um, for everybody else, uh, you can either type a question in the chat or we can be bold and you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly. I would like to suggest that we just follow up on what um, the topic for this morning was first. And if there's any questions about what Dr. Morris has just been talking about, let's talk about those and then we can shift. We have plenty of time for both. If you wave, I can unmute you, but you can also do this directly. And there are 33 people in the call, so not everybody has video. So are there any questions? Dr. Morris? Yes, ma'am. Do you think Paul deliberately left, my, my name's Peggy. Do you yeah. think Paul deliberately left out the women because he thought that would be a distraction for people to believe him because of the role of women during that time? So Peggy, um, literally in the chapter, uh, chapter 15 in Corinthians, in, in the chapter 14 discussion about uh, speaking in tongues is where that um, infamous uh, phrase from Paul comes where he says women should not speak in church. Um, you know, it's, I, it's hard to know. Um, you know, what, what's so bizarre is that all four Gospels are crystal clear that the women are the ones who find the empty tomb. Um, and I would argue, and I, I think most of y'all would agree, that if the, if the role of being a pastor, of being a prophet, of being a disciple, um, to, of being a priest, uh, as a Christian is to tell the story that Jesus is risen, that clearly falls to the women. I mean, in all four gospels, it falls to the women. Um, and yet, either Paul is not familiar with the story um, or for, for some reason, particularly uh, in dealing with the Corinthians and whatever problem is happening in, um, in the Corinthian church, 
uh, he just feels like it would not be helpful to, to include the women because the conclusion I just drew, I, I think any rational person would draw. Um, and so how can you say women should not speak in church if you then are gonna say, and it was the women who first um, discovered the empty tomb. So I don't know the answer to it. Um, I, I ultimately don't think that Paul as, is as misogynist as he has oftentimes portrayed to be. Um, I think it's very clear that some really weird things were going on in the Corinthian church. Um, that you know we only have Paul's version of it trying to uh, solve those problems because in other letters Paul does not come across as so misogynist. In fact, if you look at uh, when he starts um, naming the people who are supportive of him and who you should listen to, um, Paul is pretty even uh, in naming both men and women. Um, he goes out of his way sometimes to point out how important uh, and influential women are in the early church. So I think you can't just draw the conclusion that uh, he did it because he was opposed to women. But it, but it is a weird thing when you think about our general understanding of the post-resurrection appearances. Okay, we have another question. Um, since these are not intended to be accurate historical accounts, could the differences in the accounts be the result of each speaker sort of selling the idea of Christ and the resurrection to their listeners? This is all about selling uh, the resurrection. And um, that, that's, again, I'm going to spend the next two sessions talking about what, what is it they're selling? You know, what, why have they written it the way they have that just from, from my reading and my understanding? Um, but look, there's a lot of stories out there, right? I mean, the fact that we have the stories that we have, um, there were other stories. You know, uh, John is saying that uh, Jesus did so many things, it's too numerous to count. Well, he picked the certain ones. Why did he pick those stories? You know, same thing's true with the others. And then probably the most in some ways I find appealing is why Mark didn't tell a single one. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, can I speak? Yes, go ahead. Minna Glenn. Yes, I profoundly believe in the resurrection, but I'm not in the Fizrek camp. I look at the fruit of it. Yeah. The men, not the women, they were convinced, the, the men who were terrified, and ashamed became able to take his message to the world. So I believe their experiences. And I, I, I see these um, writers as trying to make sense of it the same way I'm trying to make sense of it. Uh, that's all I have to say. Yes, I mean, I, I, we're definitely gonna try to address that. I, I wish there, and maybe this is making me realize we could have more of a discussion than I, I thought we could. So. Um, yeah, as I, as I began, something happened. It, you cannot argue that nothing happened. Uh, something did happen. You know, people had an experience of the risen Christ. Now, what was that? And then, um, you know, how important is the physicality of it? Uh, again, I, I will talk about that um, because the, the two uh, writers that make it, uh, they, they harp on it. And, a, a, in a very big way are both Luke and John. You know, Luke and John go out of their way to, to make sure we understand that uh, Jesus's uh, resurrection is a physical resurrection. He has um, uh, ultimately Thomas put his hand in the wound. I mean, that's pretty graphic when you think about it. Um, but Luke does the same thing. You know, Luke wants to make it crystal clear that Jesus is not a ghost. So um, again, we'll, we'll, I'll talk about that in the next couple of sessions. Right. Yeah, one of, my, one of my favorite parts of the resurrection stories is how they just assume that, as everyone knows, ghosts have these certain attributes, and Jesus was definitely not a ghost. We know that you're all thinking that, but no, he wasn't. Yeah. All right, y'all, look, before we run out of time, I, I know a few of you are interested in the role of church health and... Um, in the COVID issues. So let me just uh, talk for a couple of minutes and when we have to leave, we have to leave. But um, so uh, 
Look, church health these days have, has changed dramatically. Uh, the way we are doing uh, our work is 100% different than it was um, a month ago. Uh, you would be proud of, of our ability to have completely upended our, our workflow. Um, these days, 80% of our visits with patients is through telehealth, um, but on the COVID issue. So we now um, have a drive-through testing center, which is uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at Crosstown. Um, as of today, you still have to have an appointment and you have to have symptoms. Uh, over this next week, hopefully that's going to change, but this is all being driven by the CDC and our, uh, our abilities to do the testing. Um, but we, um, as of right now, are not testing asymptomatic people. But if you have even a runny nose, you or anybody else should be tested. And all you have to do is make a phone call. The testing is free um, to come to the Church Health site. It's again, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Now on Friday, um, we are working in partnership with the fire department. Um, and I'll just tell you about our experience on Friday uh, with what we're referring to as a pop-up testing site to explain what is the unbelievable difficulty in Memphis of dealing with this. So, um, so on Thursday, the fire department canvassed uh, a high-rise apartment building that's uh, owned and run by the Memphis Housing Authority, which is at the end of Beale Street. Um, surely anytime you've ever been to FedEx Forum, you would have seen it. You might not have known what it was, but um, it's primarily uh, housing people with either chronic mental illness or some other type of disability. So the fire department went through the building on Thursday, and then on Friday, the church health uh, COVID testing team, which is an army, y'all. It takes 20 people to run one of these sites. Um, we were there to test the people the fire department thought needed to be tested. Um, it, it all went incredibly smoothly. You know, I, I don't know yet how many um, uh, ended up being positive, at, but whatever. So, but he, the story I want to tell you is a reflection of how hard this is in a city like Memphis that poverty is all around us. So in the middle of the morning, I went down just to sort of give a pat on the back to my team and to, you know, thank the fire department for being willing to work with us and they've been fantastic working with us. Um, but I get there and a woman in her mid fifties uh, has just been tested and her nose is bleeding. So look, this, um, uh, test is, is not pleasant. Uh, if anybody's had one, I mean, you stick the, the swab up a person's nose and it has to go pretty far. And, and the fact that her nose was bleeding to me is a reflection that my staff did it right. Um, but she was worried that her nose was bleeding. And so they asked me if I would see her. So I, I go over, I talk to her. She's in her mid fifties. She lives in this building. And then I tell her what I would tell anybody about how to deal with a, a bloody nose. It, was, it wasn't bleeding badly, y'all. It was just a bloody nose. It was like picking off a scab from, from doing the test. And so I tell her what is the most common way of dealing with a bloody nose is you, you take ice and you put it right here on the bridge of your nose and, th and then you would squeeze your nose together. But the critical thing is putting ice right on the bridge of your nose. And so, I tell her that, and then she says to me, where do I get ice? You, you see the problem. Um, you know, th this is true all over our community. Um, how do we tell people to self-isolate if they live in a two-bedroom apartment and there are seven or eight people in that apartment? Um, there has become a real fear of testing. We actually now have more testing capacity across the city than we have a demand for the testing. Um, you know, it's, this is just 
really hard. And to me, it's a reflection of how, um, what's gonna happen in our city because of the issues of poverty. Uh, it, it, it's, you know, hopefully we're gonna get past it, but the issues of social distancing have become very difficult. Um, but it, one of the things Church Health is leading is, um, if you're not aware, we're working with churches across the community, uh, the entire faith community. Um, you're welcome to join as well. We have a Facebook page, which is called Memphis um, Clergy COVID-19 Response. That's a very creative uh, site, I know. But uh, so Memphis Clergy COVID-19 Response. There are webinars on there every day. Um, Anything from, we had one this last week with uh, children uh, and spirituality during COVID-19, um, issues around SNAP and uh, how to access food. Uh, we're trying to get churches uh, of all ilk, denomination, uh, Temple Israel, the Muslim community is very involved with this. There are over 500 congregations uh, working together, which is an amazing thing. Um, I'm sure Idlewild is a part of this as well, but anyway, that's in a very quick way the types of things that Church Health is doing. A any other questions just about that? So you, you may have, have answered my question, but and sort of tying the earlier part together, you, you've got a skill to take disparate information and try to come up, if you solve the resurrection, I, I, I'll say uh, uh, you're, you're, you're even more of a miracle worker than I think, but uh, you, know, you know, as we as, as your members of, of the congregation or, or the community, what are, besides the, the Methodist clergy, what sources do you use to try to understand what's really going on in the community with regard and, and what the needs are? All right, so how it's organized in Memphis is the, uh, the Memphis COVID Task Force, which um, the two leaders are the two mayors. I will tell you all, if there was ever an argument for consolidation, consolidated governor, government in Memphis, this would be it. Um, that's one of the things I hope might happen after this is all over that, I mean, you just can't run things like this smoothly when you're dealing with two different governments. It's hard enough to deal with one government. But um, anyway, the two mayors lead that. Uh, the task force um, is led by Doug McGowan, who's the chief operating officer for the city. Um, who is a former military guy who is running this like a military operation and this is what we need to happen. Uh, Doug's doing a fantastic job in my opinion. Um, from the medical standpoint, um, it's split between uh, uh, Dr. Jane, uh, Manoj Jane, who you may have seen or read his thing. Manoj is an infectious disease doctor in Memphis who's actually been hired by the city um, so Manoj is the infectious disease person. And then um, uh, Elisa Householter, who's the head of the health department, who I, I know Elisa can come across as like being, you know, not particularly dynamic. And she's taken a lot of hits about not being uh, transparent. I, I personally think Alyssa's doing a fantastic job uh, in an impossible situation. But, but the two of them, are leading the medical component of this. But there are just all these other elements that are part of the task force. Um, the fire department, the health department are incredibly important. There's a hospital arm to this. Um, we're working with the Memphis Medical Society on the private doctor component. Uh, one of the challenges there is that many private doctors don't wanna test um, for, for reasons that make some sense. They're afraid their, their staff could get um, infected and therefore they would have to close down. Um, it's easy to understand that. Uh, then there's the Safety Net Collaborative, which is Church Health, Christ Community, the Memphis Health Center. There's four or five other clinics that are working together. Um, that entity is mostly the ones working to do the community testing and uh, trying to find ways to stand up testing in our poorest communities is, it's been a challenge. Um, but at the end of the day, testing right now is the limiting factor, believe it or not, are the swabs that we use to stick up people's nose. Um, that, that is what there's not enough of. That there actually, at today, there actually is a, 
uh, today, there's enough uh, lab capability to run the test and we're now getting them back within 24 to 48 hours, um, but there aren't enough um, swabs. I know we're running uh, short on time here, but I do want to honor the person who asked a question over chat. Um, it's a two part question. You've touched on the first one. Will Church Health have capacity to test everyone who wants a test? It sounds like there are plenty of tests right now, but the CDC has not relaxed guidelines on who can get tested. You have to have some symptoms. So you touched on that. That's right. How, how can we safely go back to work unless each of us knows if he or she is carrying the virus? And that's kind of a question about end game here. Anna, would you care to speculate on that? Yeah, so um, I'll just focus on testing. Testing is really important, but it is not the only thing. Um, you know, tracking down contacts, that, that is so important. Um, and that is so hard to do. Um, and people have to participate in that because so once you get tested, you know, who have you been in contact with for uh, close contact with for at least 10 minutes over the last 48 hours since you had symptoms? Um, that, that is the way you ultimately uh, let the virus uh, play itself out and you don't spread. But that is amazingly labor intensive. And look, y'all, I came to Memphis 34 years ago because I read it was the poorest major city in America. Um, not a lot has changed there. And as of today, there is no money to pay for any of that. I mean, there has not been a, a dime yet of federal money that, that has flowed to Memphis. So this is the, you know, it is on the backs of the hospitals, on the backs of a place like Church Health, which you would argue that's crazy, um, on the backs of uh, volunteers. Um, you know, UT has played an important role in the Tiger Lane testing site. Um, there, there does seem to be money to actually pay for the testing because most of the testing has been done by um, private laboratories. Um, but the tracking down uh, contacts and expanding the testing and to running the sites. I mean, like, just to run a site, um, a pop-up site is going to cost between seven and ten thousand dollars per day per site. Now, the city and county have made some money available for that, but they're taking it out of the uh, county coffers, and as y'all know, the county doesn't have any money. So, so when do we got to go back to work? I mean, absolutely, we can't, we can't go back to work until we feel the people we're around are, are safe. Uh, yes, testing is critical to that, but tra tracing contacts is as critical. Um, and then we just have to continue to practice social distancing. And, you know, again, the, the prediction of the surge in Memphis, this is what's so hard here, y'all. I mean, maybe New York is over it, but our surge as of right now isn't gonna happen until the middle of May or early June. So the rest of the country is talking about going back to work and the hard part for us is still in front of us. And like with everything else, nobody's gonna care about Memphis. I mean, that, that's been my experience for all these years. The only people who care about Memphis are people who live in Memphis. You know, Nashville doesn't care about Memphis. I assure you, Washington doesn't care about Memphis. So we can only get through this is, is if we develop a Memphis-centric plan. So one, can I follow up on the swabs because I, I keep hearing that on TV. And you know, it, you know, Q-tips doesn't don't sound like they ought to be all that difficult to make. Um, is it because of certifications, or I mean, what's the challenge here? Why are you know? And it has something to do with with uh, by trade fight with China or whatever. But why isn't some company in the U.S. just gearing up and making ten million of these things? A good question. I mean, they're not cotton swabs. They have to have a you know in order to 
transfer the virus in the way it needs to be. So it's not just making Q-tips. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I mean, there's even uh, a, a small uh, entity in Memphis that has started to make some swabs. I mean, look, we're going to get there. I mean, again, every day this changes. I don't feel like we're going to forever be held hostage that we don't have swabs, but it's the problem right today. Um, and and the problem tomorrow, that's, that's been the challenge. I mean, every day there's a new, a new hill to climb. Well, we look forward to um, hearing from you again in a couple of weeks. I'm sure the situation is so fluid. Uh, it'll look like a different world, maybe even in two weeks. Um, but we do right. have so, a worship so, service to get yeah. to. And, and let me just, y'all, I'm going to do John totally on, on its own. So um, next time, at least read the resurrection stories. And again, in Mark, uh, Matthew, and Luke, and that's what we'll cover the next time. Good deal. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Morris, um, right. for your time. And it's very valuable. And I know you're pulled in a lot of directions right now. So we are so grateful for you to join us. Uh, next week, guys, we're going to have somebody from um, the cafe come talk about resilience. And then the following two weeks, we'll be back with uh, Dr. Morris again. So y'all take care, peace into your weeks, and enjoy worship if you haven't been this morning.